This is your Tech News Briefing for Tuesday, December 27th. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. Much of what we do day to day adds to our carbon footprint, from the food we eat to the clothes we wear. To tackle those pieces of the climate puzzle, some tech companies are looking beyond green energy and coming up with more novel solutions. All this week at Tech News Briefing, we have a special series for you, a close look at the next generation of climate tech. Startups that have gotten investors plenty excited. But many of those projects are still not profitable, commercial, or in some cases, even fully out of the lab. So what will it take to get those technologies to a place where they can make a difference? Today, The words cloud storage bring to mind a certain image of documents, photos, and other data floating around in the air somewhere. But of course, all that data is actually stored in physical locations. Data centers, lots of them, running day in and day out. And all those computers, well, they need an enormous amount of energy to run and keep them from overheating. The U.S. says a typical data center can use up to 50 times the electricity of a normal office building. So how can you make a data center more efficient? One somewhat out-of-the-box idea. Stick them underwater. Let the ocean keep the computers cool. You know how you get shivering cold when you're wet? Same idea. Water is just better at cooling things than air. A few years ago, Microsoft gave this idea a shot with a project called Natick. In 2018, Microsoft researchers submerged a full-size cloud storage center in the waters of the North Sea. Two years later, they pulled it back up. So what did they learn? Here with me to talk about it is Spencer Fowers. He worked on Project Natick and is principal researcher on Microsoft's special projects. Hi, Spencer. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Zoe. Glad to be here. Why even consider putting a data center at the bottom of the ocean? (laughs) It's a good question. So there's a lot of benefits to that. The first one that most people think of is free cooling. When you put something at the bottom of the ocean, the temperature stays the same year round. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, summer, winter, it's always the same temperature when you get below about 100 meters. Cooling something with water is much more efficient than cooling with air. So we actually get to use less electricity What did it look like? What was the process like of getting it underwater? Natick is actually a big steel cylinder, and we can manufacture hundreds of these steel cylinders and just have them waiting and ready for use. We deployed this in the North Sea off the coast of the Orkney Islands up at the European Marine Energy Center. It's one of the world's most well-renowned centers for testing wave and tidal devices. So they actually have berths that you can rent in the ocean that already have the cabling out to that location. And we would use the cabling that's already out there for the wind farm to connect our data center to power and to get the data back to shore. What about protecting the computers that are in there? I mean, I understand they're in a steel cylinder. I assume it's waterproof uh, if it's going underwater. But how do you make sure the computers stay safe and don't corrode? Well, that's actually one of the benefits that we found as we did this project. Computers really don't like the same type of environment that we humans like. Uh, Oxygen causes the components to corrode. Bumps and jostling can cause things to get disconnected. By putting it down at the bottom of the ocean, we removed all the oxygen from the cylinder and filled it with dry nitrogen instead. So we didn't have any corrosion. The components were better protected at the bottom of the ocean than they would be in a land-based data center. Okay, so this data center was underwater for two years. Can you take us through some of the findings that you discovered once you pulled it back up? Yeah, we had a theory when we deployed it, as I was saying, that computers don't like the same environment that humans like. And so one of the things we wanted to test was, do they last longer? We're really kind of reaching the end of Moore's Law, where we're not upgrading computers as fast as we used to. So one of our goals was to see, can we increase the reliability of our computers if we improve the environmental conditions that they're in? And we found that was true. We pulled the data center out of the water after two years, And we've been running the same computers in a land-based data center as well. What we found was that computers in the underwater data center actually had eight times as good of reliability as those on land. So we had eight times fewer failures of the components in the underwater version as we did on land. Did you guys have any specific data on what the reduction in climate impact would be? 
Yeah, I guess. So if you look at the numbers that they typically use when they talk about efficiency of data centers, it's a term called PUE, power usage effectiveness. And what that is, it's the amount of power used by the computers divided by the amount of power to use the computers and cool the data center. So the closer you can get to just a value of 1.0 is what you're going for, right? 1.0 means that we're not using any extra power to cool the data center. It's just the power used for compute and that's it. A typical land-based data center you'll see, when we, they started building data centers and used air conditioners, you had PUEs of like 1.4, 1.3. Now you see data centers with a PUE value of around 1.2 or 1.1 because they're, they're doing what's called passive cooling. The Natick data center had a PUE of 1.07. So it was more effective at cooling than an active cooled data center, something that uses like a big air conditioner. But it was as cheap to use or cheaper than a free cooled data center that you might see nowadays. Okay, then, so what are some of the challenges to deploying a data center underwater? Well, I mean, one of the major challenges, obviously, is finding a location and then getting a cable and deploying it. It takes a lot more initial planning for the site because you have to develop the platform that the container rests on based on what the subsea conditions are. What does that mean for cost, for the cost of setting up a data center like this as opposed to setting up a traditional data center? It's pretty comparable to a land-based data center. With a land data center, you have ongoing costs. You've got people in the data center to maintain it. You've got to keep the lights on. You've got to pay someone to mow the lawn, and then you maybe even have to pay rent or whatever it is on the building that you're in. With an underwater data center, you don't have any of those costs, but you have a higher upfront cost of doing the actual deployment, right? Renting the boats and taking it out there and dropping it into the ocean. But once it's down there, it's a lights out data center. Nobody touches it and we just leave it there until it's time to pull it up to upgrade the components. What does this all mean for the marine environment that it's in? How does it affect, you know, the underwater life that's already there? Yeah, it was something that we were concerned about when we did this project. And so we did a lot of additional surveys and monitored the marine environments while we had the data center down there. What we found was that more than a meter away from the vessel, you couldn't even hear it. It's actually drowned out by the uh, universal background noise of the ocean, which is actually snapping shrimp that you can hear from a long ways away, surprisingly. And then we also found the same effect with heat. Because water is so efficient at dissipating heat, you couldn't actually even measure a change in temperature more than a meter away from the vessel. The biggest change that we found for marine life was that we found that marine life tended to gather around the vessel because it provided a break from tides and waves, almost like a resting place. And so you can imagine having these things down in the ocean and acting almost as like artificial reefs where you keep the base platform in the bottom of the ocean and it can be colonized by you know, marine life, and you're just pulling up these cylinders and replacing them and putting them back down, but leaving the superstructure intact. Can you think of any downsides to using an underwater data center? Hmm. I, I think the biggest difficulty people have with underwater data centers right now is this idea that it's a hands-off data center. We can't touch it. We can't do upgrades. You know, for 20, 30, 50 years now, data centers have been these big rooms with people running around swapping components as they fail and trying to keep the ship running the whole time. But if you look at something similar like the telecommunications industry, you know, telephones used to be that way. It was a big building full of cords and switch gear and people having to switch things around to make it work. But nowadays, telephone gear is just a locked closet that nobody touches until it's time to upgrade the equipment. And data centers are going the same way. As computers get more and more reliable, especially as we find ways to make them more reliable, like putting them in an environment that they're made for, you're going to see that this need to constantly fix things goes away. And as they become more of just a locked closet type system, it's going to be even easier to just deploy those anywhere, including at the bottom of the ocean. All right, Spencer Bowers from Microsoft, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. According to the United Nations, nearly 40% of the world's population lives near the coast. Most of our data, on the other hand, doesn't. It's in large warehouses, typically in areas where land is cheap and doesn't come with ocean views. But as Microsoft learned with Project Natick, running data centers underwater could do a lot to reduce their energy use, and by extension, their climate impact. And now, a Houston startup called Subsea Cloud aims to go further. 
It launched a year and a half ago, and earlier this month, it deployed one of its special underwater storage centers off the coast of Washington state. So how do you turn a tech promise into a tech business, particularly one in an established market like cloud computing? Maxie Reynolds is the founder and CEO of Subsea Cloud. Hi, Maxie. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Can you describe these pods? What exactly are you putting underwater? They sort of look like 20-foot shipping containers. We place within those tanks or containers racks and then a cloud provider will come in or a company will come in and they'll often provide the servers. We simply provide a place for the servers to live and some sensors, cameras, seismic centers, so they're smart containers almost. And then we plug them in subsea to existing infrastructure in terms of power and in terms of connectivity. And then that's it. They're online and the client takes care of it. So it's kind of like you're a landlord for these underwater data centers. You know, you're, you're giving the, the housing, the, uh, the property for them to live in. Exactly. We, we build, we deploy, and we maintain the pods. How easy is it to place these pods underwater? It's actually significantly easier than most people first assume. We survey the seabed to begin with and we are looking for different geohazards, the type of marine life depending on the depth, the type of seabed. Sometimes we bury under the seabed, sometimes we sit on top of it. And what happens is when we have it on the back of a ship, so let's say we're going a little further out to sea, we're not in a port, then we will put it onto essentially workhorse equipment for the sea. We will guide it down to the seabed and we have what are called guide posts that allow you to just sort of click them in to the seabed. And essentially these guide posts that we use allow us to go back down and quite easily take them up again. And it's almost like a locking key situation. So without the key, it's extremely hard to do that. So if we talk about nation states or bad actors, for instance, then if they were to attempt to physically steal these servers, then they would actually risk destruction of the pod itself and the servers would then be destroyed. So we are aware of that feature also. Where are you operating now and who are your clients? We are probably most attractive to hyperscalers and large cloud providers and we're working with some of those now some of the more conspicuous tech companies and providers i think deploying close to cities lowers latency and that appeals to high frequency traders and gaming companies and those become natural partners for us due to the efficiency gains and things like that from the proprietary cooling so have you signed up any customers so far We have customers in line. We have deployed tactically and transitionally before, and we are now looking to get into the commercial realm. You mentioned large, conspicuous tech companies. Can you tell us who those are? I feel like if I tell you, I'll I'll jinx it. And I'm not actually superstitious at all. (laughs) But I think in the coming months, we will make some large announcements around those. And just for the the sake of not going on a deep dive with them now, uh, I'll keep them to myself. The cloud market right now is dominated by a handful of players. So how do you come in and compete with them? How do you get the people who need cloud services to choose to have your infrastructure and put their own cloud services underwater rather than just hiring one of these big giants? We don't. Basically, we go to the larger companies and say, you can't do this because it's an emerging market. In the short term, the returns are too small. And here's why it's good for you, because you don't have to buy land. You, We can take you to places where maybe the land doesn't exist. Singapore recently had a moratorium. We can drive your sustainability mission forward. And we're modular and Our lifespan is well beyond yours. So we become more attractive to them and then we don't have to compete with them. We simply have to offer our services. So your pitch is, you know, big data center provider, come put your data center in our pod. Let us be your landlord underwater rather than buying space, say, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Correct. 
All right, that's Maxie Reynolds. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Thank you very much. All right, so that's one way some people in tech think we could reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But data centers only account for a very small portion of those. What about something we use every day, like our clothes? Join us tomorrow to find out how one startup is using carbon transformation to try and upend the fashion industry. That's up next in Tech News Briefing's special series on climate tech. I'm Zoe Thomas from The Wall Street Journal. Thanks for listening. Thank you.